You know, the, the Beatles had one of my favorite songs of theirs was All You Need Is Love. And uh, I think that maybe John, the Apostle John, listened to that because we've been going through 1 John for the last, uh, I don't know how many weeks now, six weeks. And it seems like every, at least every week that I've preached on this text, I've preached about love. And it seems that John, I think, is, you know, it's the third time now that I've been, you know, that we're talking about love. And it just sometimes I think it seems like John had nothing else better to preach about than love. But that's not true. He is just talking about love so much and on such a deep level that I wanted to just to wrap, I mean, I'm not wrapping up the necessary, but one of the things that next week will be our last week, but I wanted to talk about today, I wanted to talk about getting to the, basically to the root of love. Where, where does it find its, its manifestation? Where does it find its beginning and end? And where, where does it, you know, basically, um, where does it find its, its true existence? And, and with this text, you know, I mean, in this whole, uh, book of 1 John, and if you would join, join me, you can turn your Bibles on or turn in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 4. We're going to be looking at uh, basically the first uh, 16 verses, mainly actually the verses between 7 and 16 of 1 John chapter 4. But what I want to talk about is, is in this text, in this whole book of John, you know, um, we found that first of all, back weeks ago, that when we love, it shows that we are a part of the fellowship. Of the brethren. We, it, it, it's like it shows that we are a part of God's family. And that leads me to the next thing. And then John also talks about if we love, then, then we show that we're a child of God. So both it shows that we're in the family and it shows that we are a child of God. That we have a sonship. That we are a daughter of God because of our love for one another. Because of our love that, that it's a proof. It's a, it's a presentation. It's, it's revealing that we are who we really are. And you know, if you think about it, love is the only valid test to these truths. I and mean, we can say that we're followers of Christ. And we can say that we, um, that we believe in God or believe in Jesus. But if we don't have love, it's not, it's, it's not the truth. It reveals the lie, or it reveals the truth. It's the litmus test. It's the, the only valid way of you saying, hey, listen, they are who they say they are. And, and John even goes on this text, because God is love. So if God is love, God defines, you know, love doesn't define God. God defines love. And he shows what love truly is. And it, it's the only valid test to, to, to say that what we say is what we believe and who we really are. You know, I was in the Navy for eight years. And one of the things that I used to do is I used to work on the navigation systems of the airplane. And the, it, you may not know this, but through this room right now, and, and actually I guess through your body, are traveling... These lines of flux, they're, they're like, it's, a, it's just like, if you look at, you can draw a picture of the earth, you put a globe, and out of the, out of the magnetic north pole, it's not the north pole, but the magnetic north pole of the world, out comes this flux that goes all the way around the world. And it's in there. And just imagine, you, know, that little, you have that little compass in your hand, it's a little magnetized piece of steel, what it does is it basically goes, lines up with magnetic north because of the pool of these flux lines evens it out. And so what I used to do in the Navy is I would take an airplane out because an airplane is only as good as the information that's transmitted into the airplane. And one of the things that we used to transmit to the pilots was, this is north. And if that wasn't calibrated, then they would go anywhere and everywhere and they would lose, lose direction because when you're in the dark and you're flying up at night, you don't have I-95, you don't have exit 19, you don't have that thing here. You just have that compass. And that compass tells you what's north. And, the, and if you know what north is, you know 
know where south is and you know where east and west are. Just based on the fact that it tells you where north is. And as a Christian, as a follower of Christ, life gets really dirty. It gets real murky. It gets really hard sometimes. It gets stressful. You go through financial problems. You go through relational problems. You go through emotional problems. You go through physical problems. And in the midst of all those things, you know, in, uh, husband and wife relationships and, and, and child father, child uh, mother relationships, you, you get in, in neighbor relationships, work relationships, things get murky. And so where do we, what's our, what's our bad man work? God is love. Love is our magnetic north. Love is where our compass always goes. If you're, you know, the Iranian pastor who's being tortured for being a follower of Christ rather than a follower of Islam, where does his compass go? Love of God. How did Paul, in writing, we're getting ready to start a new message series on the book of Philippians. And how did Paul write and say the things that he said about Philippi and, and, the, and being in prison? How did he say the things that he said? Because Paul's compass was always aligned with love, with North, with God's love. And so when you're talking about with Christian love, the nature of God is love. So we always and constantly and you know completely naturally bond. Our love is always going towards God. And it's always in God that we find that, that love is expressed. It's always through Him that we have our love. And so, you know, and, 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 and basically, three times in the book of John have we already read that He says to love one another. And they're always built, these, uh, these, uh, these admonitions that God gives, or that John gives us, are, are always around a, fa a fundamental fact about God. Something that we realize that God is this because He is this we love. Or God loves through us. And one of the first reasons that we love are to love. I always just want to say that. I just want to go, love. <laughs> yeah, you're going to surprise me. But yeah, um, I just, my mind rebooted. Um, is that God, first of all, John says the reason we love is because God loves. This is one of the first things that we know about God. And that is, He is love. Look what John says in verses 7 through 8. Dear friends, let us not, let us, I mean, let us, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not, does not love does not know God, for God is love. He's saying, why are we loving? Why are we, uh, why is God loving people? Because we know Him and because God is love. It's almost like He's just saying, and, and, and it's the truth, you can't help it. You just can't help it. You can try to shut it off, but then your life is going to be miserable. But when you know God, God's going to love people through you, or you're, going to be, you're just not going to be happy. And see, this is the thing, and, and, and this is one of three expressions of God that John focuses in on. In the Gospel of John, John, it, John focuses on, on verse, or chapter 4, verse 24, uh, he focuses on God being spirit. He's saying, this is God, God is spirit. He is, he's not flesh and blood. He is not like us. God is, He is above us, He's beyond us. God is spirit. John gives a, a, an incredible picture of, of who God is. He's heavenly. He's glorified. He's not uh, flesh and blood. Now, Jesus took on flesh and blood. And because He took on flesh and blood, He suffered and died. And rose again from the dead. And is in a glorified body. He's a, he, he, he is now in a glorified body. And He is our leader. He has led us through sin. He has, he has provided the forgiveness for sin, and he, will, he has led us in the resurrection, and we will follow Him one day and be glorified as followers of Christ. Not only does John say that in, in the 
gospel of John. But John also talks about in 1 John 3 that God is light. And in him there is no darkness. This light is a continual uh, statement to the holiness and the purity of who God is. God is absolutely holy. There is no darkness in him. There is no uh, there is no uh, um, impurity in him. He is holy. He is pure. God is light. But not only that, John goes into this next expression in verse 8. God is love. That does not mean love is God. It means God is love. It doesn't mean that, every, that two people just because they love each other are being godly. Because it, 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 it's, it's, it's not, it may be a whole different set of, of, of a whole different type of love. And John's going to eventually put it this way. God's love marries the fact that He's pure, that He's holy, that He is light. And His love emits from that holiness and that purity and that light. It's a different kind of love. It's a love that God's called us to. Love is this Christian love that, that John's talking about is a special kind of love that emits from the purity and the, and the light of God. And it, and, it, and it is the perfect, absolute perfect litmus test to judge yourself against. I don't know about you. But I, you know, I like to judge myself against people. I do. Do you? Maybe you know, you're, you guys are all going to be like, you're all in. <laughs> Every once in a while, I'll look at a mirror and go, man, Paul, oh, you're old and you're ugly. But then I think of Kenny and I think, man, I really look good, right? <laughs> Todd's not here, Kenny. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this is the thing, guys. We want to judge ourselves against everybody else. <clears throat> so you ever say, man, we're broke. But we're not as broke as this family. Or we're struggling, but we're at least not, you know, and, and you, you know. We like to judge ourselves against other people. But God's saying, here's what you have to valid test is. The only true valid test is the love of God. Do I love? Am I born of God? Yeah. Well, how do I know? Do I love? Does love emit out of me? Does, is God loving people through me? To know God. You know that word know. And I didn't point this out in the early crowd because you guys are special, but that word no takes on a super specific meaning in Scripture. When you hear the word no in the Bible, you need to take a double take. Because no doesn't mean the same thing it means today in the Bible. Did you know the disease, I would say that the, the, the filthy, most disgusting, and most terrible disease of the 21st century is this. When we think we know something, we are experts in it. Or just because we know something, we believe that we're doing it. One of the things that I found out a long time ago, I read this book by Willard Harley called His Needs, Her Needs. And when I read this book for the first time, I go, I know it. My wife wants affection, communication. She wants uh, financial support. She wants me to, you know, to be uh, committed to the family. So therefore, I know it. I instantaneously began to think that I was affectionate, communicating, that I was open and honest, that I was providing for financial support, that I was being a, a, a committed to the family. But after almost 20 years of reading that book and, under, and knowing that book, you know what I realized? That I struggle in affection, communication, Openness and honesty, financial support, and family commitment. That's more of a wise look at that book, not just reading it, putting it down, and going, my goodness. That's me. 
And that author is defined here. And see, no in the scripture means that we are born of God and we know God. And how do we know God? There's an experiential application of love in our lives. You might write that down. There is an experiential application of love in our lives. John and I were talking about this in the middle thing. It's not when you go on the Facebook and you say, hey, you know, somebody goes, I'm bummed. Or I'm, I'm, I'm depressed. And you go, hey, you know, here, here's a little song from Mercy Me. No. It's taking the opportunity to minister to that person in their need. Or right, someone who's, who's in the hospital, what are they going, hey, we're praying for you over here at Stent Life. No, you go and visit them. You minister to them. If their lawnmower breaks down, you mow the grass. It's an experiential way of, of relating to the fact that I am born of God. Because God is love. And I love what he says in verse 8. Anyone who does not love does not what? No God. Why? Because they lack the personal experience. They lack that personal experience with God. And here's a paraphrase of that verse. The person who does not have this divine kind of love has never entered into a personal experiential knowledge of God. What he knows is in his head. And it's never gotten to his heart. You know, a person who claims to know God and is in his union with God must personally be affected by this relationship. If I took him, let's say, somewhere right out there in front of you guys, maybe that chair right in front of you tonight, if I put a, a underneath the chair, it's taped. A piece of nuclear waste about this big. And I mean that's emitted radiation like crazy. If we had a guy get down here and be like, bury Every single person in this room within days would be what? Dead. Because of radiation sickness. No one sat in the chair. By being in its presence, you are affected forever. You can't tell me that I can't that I come into the presence of a holy God, that He touches my heart, that He changes my life, and I go on like normal. If you go on like normal, You better go back to the beginning and ask yourself a deep, hard question. Have I ever had a personal relationship with God? Because I'm going to tell you something. You can only fake it for so long. You can. He who claims to know God and is in union with Him must be personally affected by God. The relationship. Number two, not only does John say that God is love, but there's another thing John says here in verse 9 and through 11. He says that he expresses his love by his action, and that is that he sent his son. Look at this. God showed how much he loved us by what? Sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. He says, This is real love. Not that we love God. What he's saying, John? John is saying, you know what? God didn't look down there and go, boy, these guys are great. They're awesome. They so love me. They're bowing and worshiping me. They're giving themselves over to me. No. It's not that we love God, but that He loved us. And sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Dear friends, he says, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. 
Now, since God loved us enough that He He was going this direction, He was. Let's, let's just imagine for a second that God knew the inevitability. He knew that we were headed in the direction of judgment, and God was heading in the direction of being the judge. And God chose. He says, I understand my light. I understand my holiness. But I love them. I'm going to have to do something about their condition. So what did it do? His love propelled him into action. And he turned to his right hand and said, Son, here's my plan. To redeem the world, I'm going to give them the greatest expression of love imaginable. I'm going to send you as their sacrifice. The greatest expression of the love of God is the death of Jesus Christ. The greatest expression of the love of God is the death of Jesus Christ. God demonstrated, it, Paul said in Romans 5, God demonstrated His love for us that while we were dead sinners, Christ died for us. You know the word manifest or manifested means to come out in the open. God, God's love manifested, came out in the open. We call it being out. God outed His love by sending His Son. He was propelled into action by the motivation of His love for us. See, we talk we talk so much about how much we love People, we love God, we love our neighbor, we love our family, we love our friends, we love whatever. But what we don't are not willing to do a lot of times is allow that to be outed by inconveniencing ourselves to minister to another soul. When you're in that situation, you might want to go back to the beginning and go, who really am I? I, I confess something to the guys this morning in this verse, uh, in, 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 in the, the, in, the old uh, um, English version, um, the King James version, the Bible, only Bible I knew when I got saved, or, you know, everybody at the church I went to was all, it was called the King Jimmy Only Church, the King Jimmy Only Church. And so everybody had a King James, you know. It was just like, I did you were kind of out. And it was like you were in the club. But um, so I got my little King James Version Bible, and I, and I went home, and I got a new Christian, and the pastor told me, and I'm going to tell you something, guys. First John is an incredible new Christian book. It's an incredible book for new Christians. I go back, it's like a, I, I go back to default. When I'm struggling in life, I go back to default. <laughs> when I'm dealing with issues, and I'm, 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 I just I go back to default, and it's always go back to, to this 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 default, this book. God is love. But there's a passage in there, and there's a word, and I'm, I'm reading along, and I'm studying my Bible, I'm a brand new Christian, and it says He is the propitiation for our sins. And I'm like, I didn't know how to pronounce it, guys. I'll be honest with you. I was like, I was like what is that? Propitiation. Oh, I got to get a Webster's out. So I got the Webster's dictionary out, and I, I open it up, and you know what it says? It basically, this is it. He took my death. Now, it's a bigger phrase than that. Is what is substitutionary sacrifice for my sins? 
But when it comes down to it, here, you make it simple. You're looking at someone with, with everything that's in me, bear witness in my testimony and, and the existence and the, and, the, and the promise, the promissory note that's in my heart that, that God has placed there in the power of the Holy Spirit. I stand before you and, and say, I'm never, ever going to die. Never going to die. You know why? He died for me. He was killed for me. I'm never going to die. Now I'm going to shape shift. I'm going to shift from this shame, thank God. Because there's a lot of shame to shift. Don't say that too many times in church because you get in trouble. But... I'm going to shape shift like he did. Because he's my leader. He's my fo I follow him. I, I, I follow him. He's, he's, he shifted from this mortal body to a glorified body. And I'm going to because he died for me. He died for me. When it came time for someone to die, for all that I've done, Jesus died. Now here's the thing, how do you kill God? You kill God in a finite, for a finite moment. You kill me forever. If I die, I die for how long, Randy? Eternity. Eternity. But when Jesus died, he died for three days and he was rose from that death. He took that substitution. He took that 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 death because of the love of Almighty God. It went into action. It was propelled into action. And you didn't just go in and say, you know, I love those guys down there. I'm going to Twitter about it. Well, I really love those people, but they're going to die and go to hell. Darn. Hashtag, I wish I could do something about it, but I can't. <laughs> No, no, He goes, I love those people down there and they're going to die and they're going to spend eternity in hell. Hashtag, I'm sending my son. That's real love. Y'all. <laughs> we have discovered that God is and what God has done but there's a third foundational truth in this scripture about God that we need to learn. This is the last one. And that is, what is God doing? He is abiding in us. He is abiding in us. Listen to this. I love this. This is an incredible passage of scripture. No one has ever seen God. But if we love each other, God lives in us and His love is what? Brought to full expression in us. The lady at work. How is she ever going to know about God's love? You can't see God. We, what's the first thing we, we said? God is love. It's one of the third things that we learned about God. God is holy. God is love. But what's the other thing? God is spirit. You don't see God. You see the effects of a lit up, loving God who, who lights up the world with His Son, who kills Him for us, who comes inside of us, and then we become propelled into the world to be this full on expression of the love of God. I am sending you because he what? Sent me.
This truth is revealed into the, to, the, to us in the Word, but it is also revealed to us on the cross where Christ died because God is love. And it's not just some simple Bible doctrine that we come here every week, week after week after week, and we learn, but it is demonstrated on Calvary for what reason? So that God died for us and now resides in us so that we can be an expression of Him into the world. God does something in us because He doesn't want us just to be mere students of the Word. God does something in us because He doesn't want us just to be spectators. Man, look what God did on the cross. That's awesome. We are self own fingers. No, because we're so used to spectating. No. God died for us on the cross. He lives in us in our hearts. We ex we 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 ex experience his love not to be spectators and students, but to be participators in that love drama. It's all part of the love. If I love John, I'm being obedient. I've seen John. John's kind of never... He, I bet, you know, I don't know. You've never really had to crawl out of a ditch and land together. Well, I've seen you do it, but people before. It's not great. <laughs> I think I love John out of fear. He's going to do that one day. Hey, listen, bud. I need to talk to you. Oh, no. Here we go. No, I love John... But because, of, because God commands me to, that is good. It is good. I'm proud of myself. I'm obeying God. Here's what God's saying, though. If you really want to be a part of the drama, you really want to be a part of the, the, whole, the whole what I'm trying to do in this world experience, you will look at the cross you will see my expression of love towards you. It will come and, 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 and it will come into your life through the power of the Holy Spirit. It will abide in you and it will motivate you to step out of your comfort world and it will motivate you to love people because of being loved. It will send you to your neighbor who you're like, man, that lady is... A hater, but I'm going to love her because God loved me and I'm motivated. It will send you to Haiti to sleep on ground because you love those orphans so much you don't care. I'm going to be honest with you, I'm not big on orphans. I, I just treat strippers one day, I'm just not big on them. But you know what I'm doing? I don't want it. This is what God put in my heart. Call it wrong, call it. I'm excited about leading and loading up a group of people that I love and live like so. And I love taking them somewhere where they can love with this. That's what I love. That's me. Because I see them sleep on the ground. And I see them fight off mosquitoes and chicken. I don't, you know, I'm not big on homeless. I really am not. And I'm just waking up in the morning first thing going, hey, let's go find a homeless guy. But I love meeting a church to get down there. Get in it. And have and serve out. Corn beef hash and eggs and bacon or whatever to homeless people. And just stand there and talk to some homeless guy named Raymond. I love Raymond. I just love talking to him.
what is God doing? What is God doing? You know, there was a drama class. I heard a story. It's one of the preacher stories. And drama class didn't really have any money for scripts. So what they did was they bought one script and they cut it up. Pat, you're going to have to let one of them. They cut it up and they made it into little sections. That thing just followed her right out of the room. They, made it, they cut it into little sections. And uh, they handed it out amongst the class. Is it me or can you still do that thing? <laughs> I, I, I was scrapping. What was I? They cut this thing up into little sections and they handed it out on the drama class. And the drama class read it and they go, we don't get it. We just don't get it. And then the teacher goes, hold on. And she took her copy of the script and she read the whole play. And everybody that had a part goes, I get it now. I understand. It said that a that God walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the evening. They could walk with him, they wanted. They weren't righteous, but they were pure. And they were tempted and they fell. No more walking with God. Then it said that he walked with Abraham. He walked with Abraham. And then they went into captivity and then they came out as a people. And Moses and the people built the tabernacle. And then it says they dwelt with them, lived among them. Randy, please help her out. A Jewish person would walk by the tabernacle. And they would go, there is where God is. There is where God is. And then they sinned. And God left. And then Moses and Solomon built a meeting on Moses. David and Solomon built a beautiful temple in Jerusalem. And everybody would go by that ornate, beautiful temple and it's like, it's where God is. Yeah. And then, one day, that temple was destroyed because those people left God. And then one day, the perfect timing, God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, and died on the cross, and then He rose from the dead. And then 40 days later, He sent His Holy Spirit to indwell us, to abide in us, to live in us as followers of Christ. We're all a part of the humongous drama that is centered around the love of God. When you read this text, he says, no one's ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us, and His love is brought to full expression in us, and God has given us His Spirit as proof that we live in Him and He in us. Furthermore, we have seen with our own eyes and now testify that the Father sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. All who confess that Jesus is the Son of God have God living in them. And they live in God. We know how much God loves us and we have put our trust in His love. 
God is love. Guys, I want to just I want to wrap this up right here. Look at your love. Is it God who abides in you, who dwells in your very being, that is motivating you because of the work that Christ did on the cross? And by Him living inside of you, He is propelling you. He is moving you forward in this drama of life. And expressing his love through you so that every man, woman, and child that you come in contact with come in contact with the expression of God's love. And therefore, experience who God is. Chances are, you guys come to church And I, would, I, won't, I won't ask anyone to raise their hand, but I want to ask you, chances are, you think about this. How many of you in this room had an experience with God at least, you know, five times this week? Don't raise your hands. If you being followers of God didn't make five times this week, Maybe three. Maybe two. If you being followers of Christ didn't experience one or two, maybe even three moments with God, how many do you think those people out there are experiencing without it? Zero. And they are going to suffer death for eternity. I've got a young man in my life right now. He's close to my heart, and I'm learning to love this guy. And I know he doesn't know Jesus. He's Catholic. He goes to church. But you know he has no relationship with Christ. The love that God has shown for me, He reminds me a lot of a 20-year-old me. A good guy who just needs Jesus. He needs to pass from death to life. Whose responsibility is He? John? Whose responsibility is He? He's mine. Because God died for me to put me in the drama. I experience Him. He divides me. And I take Him on the road show. Tomorrow morning, I am experiencing Christ with Him. Probably one of the most important messages I've preached in a long time, and I'll tell you why cell phones are going off like crazy today. Don't let it distract you. Listen to the Spirit of God right now. I believe the Spirit of God is talking right now to your hearts, and He's giving you a picture of the drama. He's giving you a picture of your role. He's giving you a picture of the responsibility. He's giving you a picture of how much He really loves you and loves others. I love hearing John teach on the subject. I'm going to just move on. I love hearing John teach on the subject of Romans Day 28. You just experienced the truth of that passage. You know, we always think all things work together for good for those that love God and call Him. And we take it and personalize it like our individual things that are going on in our lives. They're going to work out. Oh, I feel good about that. What if it isn't 
about you in that text? What if it is all things work together for good? Who's good? The dramas. It is about the mission, the purpose, the passion, the love, and the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. All these things are working out in your life so that someone will see you live out the drama. Act your part with passion and vigor because you believe every word you say because you experience the love on a daily basis. Amen? Let's pray. Father, wow, what a service. God, your power and your presence and your passion is so evident here this morning. God, your Holy Spirit is working. Your Holy Spirit is at work in the lives of folks right now, God. You're, you're teaching them. You're guiding them. You're directing them. I want to ask this question right now. You know, I'm, no, I'm not. I'm just going to pray this prayer. And I'm going to pray it for me. But if you want to follow along with it, and let it guide you. Father, help me more and more to understand the sacrifice that you made to show your love to me. Help that to motivate me not to be a student of the Word or a spectator watching this passion unfold that Jesus did on the cross, but being a participator in the drama itself. How will they see a Spirit by what the Spirit is doing in and through the life of this participant. By the fact that you abide in my life, help me to be loved. Help me to, to experience your love. Help me to love those around me. Starting in my home with my spouse, My wife and my husband's a jerk. Help me to love them. Help me to be just loving. You're going to have to love them through me, God. My children are being disobedient. Help me to take things to the level of love. Not just cop out on them and make excuses or buy them a new PlayStation to make them happy. Or not just be concerned about their happiness or their health. But be concerned about their character and their godliness and the fact that they feel loved by me. Help me, God, just love my neighbors. Love them. But you don't understand what my neighbors did. They poisoned my dog. Right? Love them. You don't understand their love. Help me, God, to be loving towards that guy at work, that lady at work who needs Jesus. Their lifestyle. I don't want to hear about your lifestyle. I want to hear about your love style. How you love them. If we believe what we say that this church is named Sin Life, that doesn't mean all of us go to Haiti every summer. That doesn't mean we don't. But what it means is we are sent to be an expression of love, to act it out so that people can see what is God really like. 
Father, I thank you so much for this message. I thank you so much for teaching me this through this message, God, to be more loving. We ask in your name. Amen.